Hi, I'm here in beautiful Sedona, Arizona today to talk about 10 things that could sabotage your Northern Arizona cabin sale or purchase. So these are 10 issues that could crop up. I mean, hopefully not, but they're things that do happen that I see sometimes and I wanted you to be aware of it just in case you're in the middle of a cabin sale or purchase. And, um, <laughs> And just I want you to know that they exist. So number one, the number one issue I see causing the problem is the septic inspection. Now every home in Arizona that is on a septic tank, and there are quite a few of them in the rural communities, require upon the sale uh, an ex inspection by a qualified septic tank company and what that is is for the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality they want to go in and make sure it's up to standard it's not leaking they're mostly concerned with it not polluting the environment so um, as a seller I might actually schedule my septic inspection about the time I'm listing the property so there are no big surprises at the end, which is actually happening to me right now. Um, and then you could always have it pumped again later prior to the sale yeah, if that's a concern because I know you do want it to be pumped before a new uh, owner comes in and takes the place. But things that can crop up, um, your septic tank linking, um, maybe a septic tank... Um, being accessed in the wrong place, the bottom instead of the top, or things like that, which might cause you as a seller to make a repair. Now, the biggest concern that you're gonna have, and I am working on this issue right now, is when they dig it up and, oh my goodness, it's a cesspool. Now, a cesspool <laughs> is illegal here in the state of Arizona. In fact, I wrote a blog post on this very topic, and if you wanna go down into my comment section, I'm gonna leave you a link if you want you know, very specific information about septics, but a cesspool is illegal. Now, you could work it around and transfer the property with the cesspool, but the new owners are going to have to replace it because what's going to happen is if the county finds out, um, they're going to deem your property as uninhabitable. So, you know, maybe you could go a long time without anybody noticing, but if you ever want to put on a building permit, you, you know, get a building permit or anything like that, uh, right now, oops, uninhabitable. So that is something you should really have information ready and another thing that happens is sometimes you dig up the septic and ooh, there's a cesspool and now your buyers think that you knew that all along and you were just holding that information uh, from them which almost is never true but you don't want people to get that impression so if you have the septic issue resolved before your home is on the market that will make the sale and transition much easier. Now, one thing to know is that in Munts Park, they are on a sewer system. So that is one area where there's wood cabins that you don't have to deal with the septic and that is wonderful. Uh, number two is your water source. So if you have no water, chances are you could do one of two things. You could get a water hall where you get a gigantic cistern tank and you hire someone to come fill it up once a month or however you need it. The other option is to drill your own well. Now that is very expensive, but it could be worth it in the long run, especially if you're getting a good deal on the property. Maybe you could share it with uh, some of the neighbor properties. So that's an issue. But now I want you to know that if you are on a private well or a private shared well, you're going to have to have a well inspection. And they're going to, during the inspection, test the quality of the water and make sure it is drinkable. Now, what I want you to know is that occasionally, certain times of the year, I think it's spring, the well water will always come back with questionable results, just the way it all works out with the snow melt. Um, and it may not be a problem with the well at all. Uh, some lenders are aware of this and they can work around um, because it's really not the well, it's just something that is seasonal. Um, so it could come up. I have a lender that knows how to deal with that if you are concerned about it, um, but that's just something to look for. You have to do a well inspection. Now, if you're on a shared well, but the shared well is owned by a private water company and the water company is something that supplies the area and you buy the water from the water company, you don't need the inspection because the private water company is the one that's gonna maintain the well and make sure that is in good shape for everyone to drink out of. Okay, one more thing that come, can come up is if you are on a private 
road. Now, with some lenders, nobody cares if it's a private well, but other lenders have what they call an overlay on their mortgages. And if you have a private well, they require a private, not a private well, I'm sorry. If you have a private road, they require a private road maintenance agreement to give you that loan. Now, sometimes there is a private road maintenance agreement, but for instance, me, my place in Mormon Lake, we have a private road and we don't have a maintenance agreement. What happens is every few years, one of the neighbors will say, hey, I wanna get some more gravel and fill in those holes. Can everybody pitch in 200 bucks? And we do, and he fixes the road, but it's not recorded. And some lenders will force you to record that, the maintenance agreement. And if you're in a area where it snows, they may also record um, who is going to remove snow so that you can get into the property. Again, not an issue on all properties that are private road because some lenders don't care, but if you've got a mortgage company with an overlay, that is something to look out for because it can crop up in the last minute and either delay or ruin your deal completely. Another thing is off-grid property. So now off-grid is not a problem, actually, they're great, but sometimes it'll cause an issue with your lender. Now I know of a lender that says off-grid is fine as long as you can give me three other comps in the facility where the home is off-grid and they are in under contract, they've been sold in the last year or currently under contract and they will go for it. Now I've heard of one lender who just needs one comp, so one home in the area that's been sold within the last year and they're okay selling you or lending on that property. But that is something to know if you're considering making an offer, you might want to talk to your lender first or if you are a seller and you're off grid and you get an offer, make sure that you uh, clarify that the lender is willing to lend on it before you go under escrow and then three weeks later you find out you, you can't get a loan. So. Okay, so the fifth thing that could pro cause a problem with your home sale is if you have a non-permitted addition on the home. Say you had your brother-in-law come one weekend and you closed in the garage bay and made a room or you added a room on the house and you never got a building permit, this is gonna cause a problem down the road. And if that's happened, you probably want to address it up front, go to the county, see what you need to do to make that a legal addition. Oftentimes it's really not that big of a deal, but um, that's gonna come up when you do the sale, you have buyers come in, they're looking, what's this? Is this counted in the square foot? And if you want it to be counted in the square foot, which you probably do, it's gonna improve the value of your home, it needs to be permitted, and there needs to be airflow in the room. I don't know all the stuff, but the county will. Otherwise, you're going, your buyer's gonna look at the property and say, what is this? It's $500 a square feet, and that's because they're not counting the square footage of your addition, and you're gonna have a problem selling the home. So that's number five thing to look out for. Um, also with the additions, be really careful with the electrical. I showed a property in Munts Park the other day. We went into the garage and I see wires hanging, light bulbs swinging from a wire, five or six outlets switched. You have to go through six or seven to find the one. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story though about why you need to be careful with this type of electrical not up to code deal is back and it was a long time ago, 1955. My step-grandfather uh, lived, uh, I think they were in Coney Island, and he had one of these, Ill, I don't want to say illegal, but not to code um, electrical systems in the basement. Uh, there was a hurricane, um, and so he went into the basement to change the light bulb. He um, got his feet a little wet, climbed up on a chair, went to change the light bulb, and he got electrocuted and was killed. My father was 15 years old, went out, you know, found him in the basement. Thankfully, was smart enough when he saw him gurgling, uh, he knew to go shut the electric off, and then, you know, they, they found him and he, he was gone. So, electrical, not to code, is really a serious issue. Not only something like that could happen, but you could cause a fire. So, just make sure uh, when you're putting your home in the market or when you're buying and your inspection comes back and says there's problems with the electrical, that's probably the most important thing to ask to have fixed is the electrical system. Okay, number six thing that can destroy your house, your house sale, excuse me. My dog wants to get a drink. 
is if you're buying a mobile home or manufactured home. And the issue here, if you're buying a lot and it's got a manufactured home on it in, in you know, a beautiful second home country area, that, that is fine. In fact, the newer homes are so beautiful, you can't even tell they're manufactured homes, but that could cause you a problem with your lender. And there are going to be uh, three or four situations that will give you a problem. One, of course, is if it's not fixed to the land, then you're just buying something like a motor home and it's a depreciating asset. So you wanna buy, if you wanna buy a manufactured home, make sure it's affixed to the land and you have the affidavit of a fixture. Um, but the things you need to be concerned about with your lender is it has to be built after uh, June 15th, 1976. And what happened is at that point, HUD came in and regulated it. Um, there's a HUD plate on the back of the model manufactured homes that have this. So they're up to code. They put a bunch of safety standards in there. And um, that is what the lender is looking for. The other thing is if it's a single wide, lender may not go for that either. So you are looking at double wides built after 1976 where any lender could lend on them or any lender that's willing to. Now, it doesn't mean you can't get a loan. I have two lenders that will actually loan on pretty much any manufactured home, double wide, single wide, park model, a fixed, not a fixed. Now, the catches are probably gonna hire, I mean, charge you slightly higher interest rate than you would on a single home. So if you have three and a half percent now, you might have to pay 5%. So just example, I don't know what the mortgage rates are. So if you are looking at something like that, uh, give me a call or a text and I can provide you with the names of those mortgage companies. But that's just something again that you wanna look after. Um, oh, my dog is gonna bark now. Um, number seven, this just got to me last month and it wasn't me. Uh, I had buyers make an offer on a property and one of the pages in the contract, you can write in things that you want. And so we wrote furniture and the seller's agent and the seller didn't read that page of the contract, moved out all the furniture and then my buyers were ticked off. Eventually we lost that deal. So read the entire offer contract. If you're a seller, make sure you look at that page, anything else you want. For instance, I sold or I helped a buyer buy a house three or four years ago and there was a baby grand piano and I, we asked for the baby grand piano. Seller saw that and said no, made a counter and you know, we tried. But if they didn't look, then they'd be obligated to give us the baby grand piano and they would have been ticked off. So always read through the entire offer contract when you get offers. And if you're getting multiple offers too, it might be tempted to just look at the price because you're frazzled going through them, but read through the whole thing when you're ready to accept an offer before um, you're sorry later on. Now, number eight is not disclosing issues that are wrong with the property. So I lost a deal again because there we read through the and there's something called the seller disclosure report that when you put your house in the market you go through and you list out all the things that you know have been done or problems that have been fixed anyhow if you don't list something on that and sometimes it's an oversight you forgot but if you deliberately do it did that you can get in trouble later on and if it's a serious issue you can get yourself sued so there was a place that um was being sold which they say as is which basically doesn't mean you have to take it as is but it means the seller says they're not fixing anything um so you still should have a home inspection when that happens and the home inspector found out that some of the floor joists had been removed i noticed when we walk in the bathroom you kind of feel a little bit of squeaky under the floor it's because they had removed the floor joists now this was not disclosed in the seller disclosure report made the buyers think they're deliberately withholding information. Now it's kind of hard to say when you're in a property that they've owned for 35 years, who knows, maybe they forgot, but if you deliberately don't disclose something like that that you know, again, you're gonna get in trouble later on. Uh, number nine is not using an agent if you're buying one of these cabin type properties that understands that these issues could come up. So I'm not saying don't ever use an agent, but a lot of times we see here in Northern Arizona, somebody will come up, their brother-in-law is an agent in Phoenix, and they come up and they try to buy a house up here. And you know, 
there's nothing wrong with that, even though I would rather you didn't do it, you should hire me, but they're not gonna be familiar with these types of issues and you could get caught by surprise by something, blow your whole deal out of the water, and you don't want that. So if you are using an agent that's not familiar with the area, just make sure that you are educated on these things that go, could go wrong because they might creep up. And then number 10, right now we are seeing in Northern Arizona, there are two weeks of inventory in Flagstaff. Two weeks, that's amazing. And we're seeing multiple offers on properties. I had buyers make an offer a week ago on a property that had 11 offers. So if you offer an absurd amount over the asking price for a property, and say, for instance, the home was listed at $250,000 and you offered $350,000, woohoo, the Seller is likely to take that, but now think about it for a minute. You gotta find out, are they paying cash? Are they financing it? Because if they're financing it, it has to appraise. And so if they offer you 350, but they got a conventional mortgage, the appraiser comes in and it's not worth 350, it's worth 265, say. Um, the loan is not gonna go through and then you're back where you are now, if you've got an, someone that's come from California and they sold their million dollar condo in San Francisco and now they have boatloads of cash and they come and they think 350 is a steal, then you're fine. But just don't, um, if you're a seller especially and you see these offers for huge amounts over, just look at that with, you know, scrutinize it, make sure that they're able to do the deal without having it come back appraised at 260 and now they say hey it appraised low you need to lower the price and that will take you off so those are the 10 things uh, i apologize today i have dogs all over the place that they want to get in the video <laughs> and i'm not in my studio because it's such a nice day but um if you have any questions Feel free to text me, call me, email me. I get mostly emails from people that have questions, so that is fine. I do check my emails. Comments, I love the comments, but sometimes I don't see them for a week or two. My name is Dawn Dickinson. I live here in beautiful Sedona, Arizona, and I sell cabins and primary homes in northern Arizona. If you like the video, please like or hit subscribe. <laughs> I post something new every single week, so I hope to see you back here again next week.